Welcome to the ECB podcast, bringing you insights into the world of economics and central banking. My name is Michael Steen, and in today's episode, we're looking back at the economic response to the coronavirus crisis over the past nine months and ahead to 2021. I'm very happy to say we're joined today with the ECB's chief economist, Philip Lane. Philip, welcome back to the podcast. My pleasure, Michael. So when we last talked on the podcast in May, um, we were doing so remotely. I think you were in Dublin and I was um, at my home somewhere outside Frankfurt. Um, It's six months later. We're actually back inside the main building of the ECB, um, obviously doing this with the right hygiene measures and social distancing and so on. Just that little example shows you that we've learned a little bit about how we live with this virus and that we've adapted our ways of living and working. But how's it been for you? How have you worked through these months? So, I mean, I think both the ECB and my own uh, personal experience very much mirrors what we've seen more generally. So in the spring and in that period from mid-March really until uh, the end of May, we were in a severe situation where we were all by and large working from home. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Dublin at that time. But in the, with the miracle of modern technology, you can work uh, remotely for a sustained period. And really since then, it's been much more of a halfway house between no- normality and then right now, here we are in mid-December with, mi- with maybe uh, less in the office, more working from home. And that's been the experience of the ECB. It's been my experience. Uh, lots of more time away, away from uh, the head office here, but actually this autumn, uh, quite a bit of time back in the office. And I, I think, you know, as you indicated, that's partly we're learning to live with the virus. You managed in the spring as the chief economist and the member of the governing council to take some pretty big decisions and doing all that whilst working with your team at the ECB, with everyone in their houses, I guess, and then the governing council also meeting in this remote format. Do you have any observations or, or particular things you want to share about how that was? Well, I think... <laughs> Obviously, um, we, we will all uh, spend time at some point looking back and trying to recall that period with some perspective. But I, I think uh, monetary policy and maybe the policy world in general, unfortunately, this is not the first crisis. Um, and so in many ways, the lessons from the previous major crisis, the global financial crisis and the European sovereign debt crisis, did mean we had a lot of experience about how to respond to a crisis. But I think we can look back to that period. And um, of course, uh, not everything was going to be perfect. But I think by and large, uh, the the number one job for a central bank in that severe acute phase of a crisis is to provide stability, to stabilise. And and we did that. So there were those big decisions, the pandemic emergency purchase program, the cheap funding for banks, the Teltros, um, and a a lot of other measures, also measures by our banking supervisors. You had to, those those were sort of born of the crisis in the crisis. And if you look back at the year, how how happy are you about how those have worked and um, what are your reflections? So so I think uh, there were were three goals. One was to stabilise. And because there was a lot of uh, market dislocation at that time, uh, the immediate priority was to stabilise financial markets. The second, uh, we know quite often there's a credit squeeze. When firms are in trouble, the the natural temptation, of course, is for banks to become more cautious. So we knew we had to offset that instinct, that impulse towards tighter credit. And that's where the, the Teltros came in, the targeted lending program. And then the third is uh, when you have this large shock. Now, of course, uh, the immediate lockdown, you have to accept. I mean, if there's a public health emergency, you have to accept economic activity is going to fall. But in order to support the recovery, to enable uh, the recovery from those uh, declines to be as rapid as possible, that's where general monetary policy support kicks in. And so we needed a monetary policy to be sufficiently accommodative in order for the economy to get through this pandemic period. And that, that remains the, the, the challenge. You mentioned already the previous crises like the, the sovereign debt crisis um, and the great financial crisis. Um, the, a bit difference here was that it was also hand in hand with fiscal policy in some ways. Or can you talk a bit about how the what was the fiscal element here that was so important? Well, I mean, if you go back to the very start of the financial crisis, so in 08, 09, there was fiscal support then as well. Later on, when uh, you, you had the, the kind of uh, 
difficulty of deciding how quickly to renormalize fiscal policy in 2010, 2011, 2012. As, as we know in Europe, uh, that, that caused a lot of problems. But the initial crisis response was, was directionally similar in 2008-2009. Uh, there was a, an extra role for fiscal policy because the pandemic hit sectors very differently. There are some sectors which benefit, so, so the kind of high-tech sectors which are helping us work from home, uh, shop from home, have benefited. But uh, travel, tourism, entertainment, restaurants have been heavily hit. And monetary policy works for the whole economy when we need to have uh, policies that support workers and firms in individual sectors then that's where fiscal policy needs to take the lead and we've seen it we've seen extraordinary fiscal policy this year and we're going to continue to need extraordinary fiscal policy uh, in the next year or two we're now recording this sort of in the nearly mid-december um it's just after um both another uh governing council meeting uh, where big decisions were taken and actually also significant decisions were taken in Brussels on the, more on the fiscal support side. The most recent measures that the ECB took, what, what have we done and why did we see the need to, to do more, I guess? So I think the key word about this is, is to prolong. So what we've gotten right now is a second wave. Now, we always kind of uh, knew there would be a re- recurrence of the virus to some degree this winter. It's turned out that actually, uh, as we know now, here we are in mid-December and across Europe, there are restrictions of varying severity, restricting, uh, again, services, those sectors which rely, rely on social interaction. So as we indicated now, we think we're, we have a recession again in uh, this, these last months of the year. And so what that has essentially meant is the pathway out of the pandemic. We remain very confident, and now with the news of the vaccine, we, I think we have a clear vision of the, the exit from this pandemic. But to form the bridge from now, when we're in recession, when there's many firms losing money again, uh, many workers who are at risk, uh, to form the bridge to the other side, which we think about as you know, spring 20, 2022, essentially, 15, 18 months from now, that's why essentially we've reorganized, we've recalibrated the PEP and the Teltros to get us to that point. And I think that's what a central bank is for, is to provide stability, to provide that kind of a a pathway to allow uh, the economy to get through this, uh, to support the economic recovery, uh, and uh, as you say, hand in hand, to to make sure that fiscal policy uh, can obtain the funding uh, needed to provide the fiscal support we need. And in that context, uh, I think it's very important that we did get this agreement at the European Council. The uh, next generation EU fund will essentially be a major driver of economic activity for the next five years. And it's important we, we understand that we have a vision that will help the economy, as I say, not just get through the immediate crisis, but also has a clear momentum that will help us in the post-pandemic recovery period. Okay, and you you mentioned already there was a a slightly difficult kind of situation because there's the positive news on the vaccine, but the recession, I mean, I think the the ECB staff forecasts that there's a 2% contraction in in gross domestic product in the fourth quarter. But at the same time, you also said the economic impact is less than the first wave. So it's quite a a lot of information there, a lot of things to consider. So let me emphasize is that normally when uh, it's stated there's a 2% recession in one quarter, that would be, that that is a dramatically big number. But because we had a 15 percentage point decline in the first half of this year, of course, relative to that, it's a much smaller number, but it's still a pretty big dent in the economy. Now, again, uh, we do think... uh, Quarter three this year, July, August, September, showed that the economy can come back quite quickly. So we are quite confident that there will be a a significant recovery in the economy and in the inflation process. But we have such a big decline. I mean, I think maybe the better number to think about is the European economy right now is about seven percentage points smaller than it was a year ago. So, So this is a really big decline. We understand the reasons for it. We are confident there, you know, as the, as the virus becomes contained and especially as the vaccines get rolled out, that there will be a good recovery, but it's going to take a while. The vaccine will not instantaneously 
create the new jobs, create the new demand. And so there's probably a mismatch. So the financial markets can respond immediately to the vaccine news. But we do think the economy uh, will take those uh, 18 months, if you like. We think 2019 GDP will, will be recovered uh, towards the second half of 22. So, you know, the story of next year is going to be a major, a major program of activity uh, to get the vaccines rolled out. And then in the meantime, of course, the ECB has, has no, uh, nothing special to add in terms of public health advice, but in terms of making sure the, the financing conditions are there to make sure that there's no interruption to the recovery process. Um, that's our job. So we're building this bridge and that it's keeping financing conditions favourable. And the way we do that, there's a two big parts of it, aren't there? There's the pandemic emergency purchases and also um, the TLTROs. We've mentioned both, but maybe we should just touch on both briefly. Right. But maybe I'll just start that underneath those two programmes, because re- remember, maybe it's always the case that the most important uh, policy tool uh, any central bank has is, is the short-term interest rate, which we have kept at, at a low level, minus 0. 0.5, uh, because that very low level essentially enables and is the platform both for the PEP and for, for the targeted lending program. The efficient route is not so much to have further cuts in the policy rates right now, uh, but to focus on uh, having the support for the longer term funding. So when we uh, do these asset purchases where we're buying uh, bo- so- sovereign bonds, corporate bonds of different maturities, it provides support for long term funding, not just short term funding. And that's very important um, for those who need to borrow to get through through this crisis. Uh, and then the targeted lending program provides an incentive relative to, to, to the policy rate. And it's very important for that because we know when firms are losing money, uh, we know when the overall economic environment is, is, uh, has, has some uh, clouds in it. Resisting that, countering that through a targeted lending program uh, we, we think is quite effective. Mm-hmm. Now, the targeted lending, that works by the ECB giving banks very, very cheap access to, to money that, to help them lend on. S- some people don't like the sound of that. They sort of say, well, wh- why are you giving the banks all this money? Can you explain <laughs> the, the rationale? So, uh, I, I would try not to use phrases you use because it, it's absolutely not the case. We're transferring money to the banks. They borrow the money. Uh, they offer collateral. The banks still are, are taking the risk. They're, they're taking the risk of lending to firms, uh, small firms, lending to micro enterprises, lending to individual traders. And a sense in a recession, typically the natural instinct for a bank is say, look, there's more risk about, we need to either lend less or raise our lending rate to allow for a bigger risk premium. And what, what targeted lending does is essentially uh, fight against that because by providing access to cheaper funding, it means that maybe the lending rate can be stabilized rather than going up. And that's essentially how it's working. We look at our tools and it's very clear that one of the dangers to price stability is if this uh, recession would made, were made worse by a credit squeeze. So that's c- when banks stop lending, basically, right, exactly. or, or charge. And, and you can understand yeah. the, the spiral you get there, yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, what we, going back to this phrase we, we're using quite a bit these days about favorable financing conditions. Uh, it really sh- should not be taken for granted. Recessions tend to take our, on their own dynamic where there's this real financial interaction, which is poor economic prospects make uh, banks pull back. And if banks pull back, more firms are unable to invest or to keep on uh, financing their working capital, which makes the recession deeper. You've already talked a bit about the the vaccine and how we're not sure quite what that means, but how important it is. And obviously, that's not our that's not our role. Um, but it's a key input into what the uh, economic story of next year will be. But it means also you are actually having to look a lot of health stuff more than normal. I mean, the, in terms of the, the economic projections, these forecasts we make, you and the teams of economists working for you are now delving into understanding this a lot more to try and figure out, well, what can we say about, the, about next year? Um, could you talk about that a little more? The 1st of May, we gave out three scenarios, a baseline and then a kind of a 
severe scenario, what happens if, if this pandemic gets worse? And a milder scenario, what happens if this good news arrives earlier? And I think that framework has worked very well. Back in May, uh, the team, I think, made the correct assessment is over time we, were, we would learn to live with the virus. So the same amount of infections um, now in terms of the economic hit is less than in the spring because both the you know, health systems have learned how to, to deal with cases and uh, you know, retailers learned how to offer alternative ways of shopping. Uh, we've learned how to reorganize uh, manufacturing factories, constru- construction sites to reconcile social distancing with maintaining uh, production. So I think they've done a really good job of, of being a, you know, having a quantitatively, I think, a reasonable approach. But let me come back to this basic point is it remains uncertain. That's one of the, and that's one of the key words in thinking about next year. And this is why, if you like, uh, in our policy announcement yesterday, we emphasised our flexible approach. And our commitment is essentially to maintain conditions at a favourable level in order to uh, allow the European economy to you know, get out of this uh, situation, uh, this bridge towards the post-pandemic period. And that, I think, is the appropriate way to deal with what we have, which is next year, you know, we think uh, there's going to be a lot of news. We've already got, of course, now, uh, in the UK, uh, the initial people receiving vaccines. That's going to be the story here in the Euro area very, very quickly. And so we're going to see, we're going to learn a lot uh, next year about how quickly the logistics can work. We're going to learn a lot over time about how much protection uh, these vaccines uh, provide. Uh, we may well have to encounter some disappointing news because we, we think uh, the history of uh, any big project is sometimes is a, a bump in the road. And again, I think the fundamental philosophy of any central bank is to be a stabilizing force uh, to deal with the good news, to deal with the bad news. OK, I mean, just quickly. So the bad news, I mean, you've talked already in a, in a speech in November about how young people often are the ones who, who lose their jobs first. Um, there's also lots of questions on 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 what is the lasting kind of economic damage is a so-called scarring. I mean, do you have any further thoughts on that? Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, there'll be more scarring the more we tolerate a deepening of, of this recession. So we very much are focused from our, our monetary policy point of view uh, in, in doing what we can. And of course, the lead role is, is with fiscal policy. Uh, so whether that's uh, accelerating um, imperatives that were needed anyway, such as digitalization and investing for the carbon transition, whether it's providing support for, the fir- for those firms which are perfectly viable, but which are just taking a big revenue hit right now. Uh, and also recognizing in some cases, uh, there will need to be retraining, uh, reallocation uh, towards those sectors which are look like they're going to grow more quickly and away from those sectors which may have to uh, have a longer term adjustment. Okay, and, that, and you're hinting there that there's also some seeds of hope in that, right? Because there's also positive things that can come out of this. There's a little bit of serendipity because of course, uh, Changes in, in how we, we live and how we work creates new opportunities. And we see that everywhere, uh, that, that businesses are responding. So, so it's partly that, it's just the serendipity of how uh, the world uh, adapts, but partly it's conscious. It's conscious in the sense of right now, uh, when there's a, a lot of spare capacity, it's very good timing for governments to, to step forward, uh, to accelerate public investment, and through through the various uh, support schemes, also support those firms uh, which have a, a financial problem, but in terms of their economic contribution, can make a very good economic contribution post pandemic. Okay, before we let you go, so the final question: You've you've talked a lot about how we're we're building this bridge. We're we're trying to maintain favourable financing conditions, uh, and how busy that's going to be actually for for next year. Um, do you have any other big issues on your agenda for 2021? Well, Michael, I mean, you, you may uh, have noticed that we've also been quite busy, but in a, maybe in a quiet way with the Monetary Policy Strategy Review. Yes, we are you know, doing public events. We're, we're listening. And I think that's been very interesting this autumn to listen to different groups. But it's a huge internal uh, project for the ECB, for the national central banks. For sure, 2021 is going to be busy, uh, not just with whatever's happening in the world, but we're also trying to bring this strategy review to a successful conclusion.
And and in a sentence, how do you define the strategy or a few? What's the what's the aim there? Well, the aim is really, I mean, as you know, it's been essentially 18 years since the last one it is to at one level to validate or to cross check. Are we on the right path? It's always good to test yourself and uh, look at benchmarks and so on. Uh, but also we know the world has changed. Uh, we know the world has changed in terms of uh, digitalization, climate change, uh, demography. Uh, we, we're in a world where we know uh, there's a lot of forces pushing down interest rates real forces, if you like, and how a central bank can operate or should operate in that world is, is super important. We're learning a lot. We know a lot. But in the end, we have to draw conclusions. And, and that's really going to be the big project for this year is to bring all of that together and formulate a strategy that will bring us into the coming years. OK, Philip, it sounds like it's going to be a very busy 2021. So I, I want to wish you a uh, a, a relaxing um, uh, Christmas with, with your family in Dublin and uh, see you in January. Thank you, Michael. And uh, thank you to you and, and all your colleagues also. OK, this brings us to the end of this episode. Um, we've seen how since the coronavirus crisis hit Europe, there's been great progress to support the economy and pave the way for an economic recovery. Policymakers have acted decisively to mitigate the impact of the virus on the economy and support all European citizens. But as we just heard from Philip, uncertainty prevails. So the coronavirus is going to keep everyone busy for some months to come, even with the good news on the vaccination. We'd love to hear your feedback and thoughts for future episodes via social media. You've been listening to the ECB podcast with Michael Steen. If you like what you've heard, please do subscribe and leave us a review. Until next time, thanks for listening.